Thanks so much for pressing play. Welcome to another extraordinary episode of Legends and Losers. And this episode is brought to you by our good friends at NetSuite. To turbocharge the growth of your organization, check out netsuite.com slash legends. Today, we get to hang out with the amazing entrepreneur, Catherine Mindshu. Uh, we talk about what it was like for her to start a company at 26 years old, how to stick to your point of view and your core belief when almost everybody you talk to tells you that your idea is wrong or that's not going to work. Uh, she shares how she overcame 148 no's from venture capitalists. And she shares how she built a business that designed and dominates a brand new category. All right, all right, all right. The Ramon said, hey ho, let's go. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Hello, my legendary friends. This is Christopher. I'm so glad you're joining us for this awesome episode of Legends and Losers. If you're a longtime listener, I just want you to know how much you mean to me and everybody else here at Legends and Losers. Thank you so much for uh, being with us. And if you're new, well, I hope somebody explained what this is all about. Because <laughs> Legends and Losers is not your typical um, uh, interview uh, podcast. Far from it. And uh, I'll just give you one point of differentiation. And it's the number one thing that people don't like about Legends and Losers. They say, oh, it's too long. Why are, the sh why are all the episodes long? Well, here's the answer to why the episodes are long. Uh, we try to capture lightning in a bottle, to have a real conversation, to, to, to cut through the BS, to get to the real stuff about what it takes to have a legendary business and a legendary life. There are very few quote unquote business shows that get into um, the problems and the challenges along the way. You know, one of our mantras is you can't be a legend without being a loser. So we talk about this losery, if you will, along the way. Um, and if you're going to have a real conversation, um, it takes some time. You, I don't know about you, but I can't have a real conversation in 15 minutes. And so, um, you know, if you want a 15 minute podcast, this is not your podcast. If you do want a real conversation where we try to seriously unpack what it takes, um, then this is Legends and Losers. And we also allow ourselves to have some fun, to chase zebras down rabbit holes. Um, and, and, and what you get to experience is the arc of a true conversation, as opposed to on a typical interview show where they slice and dice the thing up and they spoon feed you only pieces. And it's a pre-constructed narrative with a, a guest spewing talking points. And you know, for the most part, it's pretty inauthentic and we don't learn all that much. Uh, we're the opposite of all of that. And if that sounds awesome, then you're in the right place. And if that sounds terrible, well, thanks for checking us out and <laughs> have a nice life. All right. Um, my dear friend, Heather Clancy, and I have a great new book coming out. I'm so proud of this. We've been working on it so hard. We're uh, deep in the editing of it now. It comes out in July. The book's called Niche Down, um, How to Become Legendary by Being Different. We would love to share chapter one of Niche Down with you. So send us an email to blackhole at legendsandlosers.com and we will send you chapter one. Now, our good friends at NetSuite want to help you turbocharge your growth. As you know, um, the cloud is the platform for business today. NetSuite was the first business management system, which you could call ERP system, that was purpose-built for the cloud. As a matter of fact, NetSuite is the category king in that space. Over 40,000 um, growing companies and, and nonprofits rely on NetSuite. And um, they offer a complete business management platform that give, gives you real-time visibility into all of your operations from your desktop, your laptop, and even your smartphone. And uh, NetSuite allows you to get a handle on cash flow, inventory, uh, orders, uh, and HR. And NetSuite is surprisingly cost-effective. So for Legends and Losers fans and listeners, uh, NetSuite has a great offer. Uh, go to netsuite.com slash legends, and you can set up a free one-hour growth review. You can talk to a growth expert in your industry to talk about the challenges and opportunities that you might have to uh, get to a whole other level of growth in your uh, business and in your category. So I would recommend check out netsuite.com slash legends as you're listening to Legends and Losers. Now, um, Catherine Mindshu. Um, she's the founder of a brand new category of career site called The Muse. You can check it out at themuse.com. I was introduced to Catherine by my dear friend, Wendy Sturgis, who was a guest of ours on episode 134. 
If you haven't checked out Wendy's episode, you will love it. She's one of my favorite people in business. And we have as no bullshit a conversation about how to have an amazing career as I think you can have on, on Wendy's episode. Um, the other sort of connection that I have to Catherine is one of her investors, Nancy Fun, was also on Legends and Losers, episode 146. And if you remember, Nancy, um, her firm is one of the early investors in a bunch of Elon Musk's businesses, including um, uh, Tesla. And we have a riveting conversation. That's episode 146 uh, with Nancy. All right, Catherine, not only is she the founder of this company, she's what you could call a legend in the making. Uh, if you're a regular listener, you know we try to shine a light on all sorts of areas of business and, frankly, life um, that often don't get talked about. And it's fun to not just talk to been there, done that people, but also uh, uh, super impressive younger people who are on the rise. And that for sure is Catherine. Um, not only is she an entrepreneur and CEO, but she's the author of a great new book called The New Rules of Work, The Modern Playbook to Navigating Your Career. So for more on Catherine, Go to legendsandlosers.com and you can check out the show notes for this episode. Now, here she is, the legendary Catherine Mindshow. I would say that I do tend to have a pretty consistent true north and it has developed in the, the how. A lot of the details of execution change as I get more information. Um, a lot of those have also really been um, influenced by the great team that we've built. But I think there are certain core things that I know and that I believe, and um, those those have been remarkably consistent. So, um, you know, I'll give you a few examples. Um, one of the reasons that I started the news was because I had a problem. I needed a solution, and I didn't find it in the market. And so, to me, all of the classic job boards, the big sites that were around at the time, they were, first of all, like wildly difficult and boring to use very transactional, you know, you type in a job title and then you get 5,732 results. Like nobody needs that. Right. And so I remember thinking, well, what if you built uh, a great brand that helped people feel supported and, and really um, part of a community as they move in their career? What if you gave people an inside look into companies, you could use videos, photos, and all of this sort of rich data and content. Um, and we'd also match that with just more general career help because just because you're looking for a job doesn't mean you might not be interested in reading about, um, you know, how to ask better interview questions or how to be a better manager. And it was funny because when I first started fundraising for the company, uh, you know, going out sort of hat in hand to all of these investors, many of whom had these big professional brands that were much more impressive or interesting than, um, you know, than I had at the time, I was a nobody. Uh, they said, well, first of all, you know, you can't do jobs and content. That's too hard. If you're going to do jobs, just be a job or if you're going to do content, just be a magazine. And I remember thinking like, you're missing the entire point. But after the <laughs> 10th, 15th, like 30th person said that, there was a part of me that was like, you know, are you so egotistical that you're going to continue doing what you think is right over all of the smart, thoughtful, well-intentioned feedback of these much more successful people? And the other answer is, yeah, I'm going to keep doing it because yeah. I believe that this is a new way. Um, and because I, I was just convinced that there was something that I saw in the market and in the need that they didn't see. And obviously, that's now a massively impactful part of our, um, our strategy, our growth. I don't think we possibly could have succeeded if we'd listened to any of that advice. But uh, it's hard. It's really difficult, especially, I think, when the disagreement comes internally, when you hire someone brilliant onto your team. And you've recruited them and you bring them on and you're so excited and, and they come to you and they say, oh, I think you're doing this wrong. We need to do it like X. Um, that to me is where it gets really hard. It's not, I mean, the external naysayers, like, of course, it's challenging. But um, I think the hardest thing for me had been we've had internal disagreement about the right way to go. And it took a while for me as an entrepreneur and as a leader to feel comfortable enough to say, I appreciate that. I understand that. I respect you but I'm going to make this call and this is the option we're going to go with. And I'm going to do it because I think it's the right one. Um, that was a really hard thing for me to get comfortable saying because um, for a while I didn't necessarily feel like I had the right to make the call just because I believed it was the right one. And why was that the case, Catherine? Um, I think it has to do with being a fairly young founder. I'm 32. I, I haven't, 
run a 120 employee company before. Um, I think that, you know, it would be great if every argument could be resolved by impeccable data or very clear market research. But sometimes you just have to make a decision and you don't necessarily have any better rationale or support other than my gut says this is the way to go or this is the one that I believe in. And uh, I don't think that necessarily comes naturally for people, um, especially potentially women, because, um, you know, I was often going contrary to a number of other people that I respected. And uh, I had to get comfortable with the fact that I couldn't make everybody happy and that at the end of the day, I needed to make choices that I believed were the right ones for the business that I was building. Well, I, I, I've been hearing this expression lately, so I'll use it. Good on you. <laughs> because here's the thing that I think some people don't get that I love about what you're saying. You're trying to create, you and your colleagues are trying to create something that doesn't exist. You, I've heard you talk about this in some of your other you know, podcasts and public appearances. You, you actually use the word category. This is a new category of service. Mm -hmm. And as a result, by definition, most people aren't going to get what you're talking about because you guys are a little of this and a little of that and a little of this, and a little of that. And you put that together. And then there's this whole other thing that's completely original that you put in. And so you've mixed some existing shit with some new shit and some totally fresh shit to create a completely new thing. And ultimately you and your co-founder, and I'm sure now your broader executive team have a pretty clear sense of what that is and an intuition about it. Um, and, and your average person can't see, if I could use this metaphor, the painting in your head. Is that how it feels or how does it feel for you? Yeah, I think that that's certainly accurate. I also think, you know, you mentioned intuition. I think that collectively the business canon is a little skeptical about the role of intuition. On one hand, you can probably read a million HBR articles about the importance of trusting your gut. But, um, you know, I started my career in consulting at McKinsey and Company. There's phenomenal training in lots of ways, but, uh, you know, intuition was not necessarily something that you were allowed to rely on, especially as a up and comer in the firm. It was data, data, data. And so I think that when you are doing something completely new, there isn't always data. Uh, you know, if you look at our category, our industry, there's job boards, uh, which are a very kind of transactional model, pay-per-click, uh, indeed being one of the biggest. There's applicant tracking systems and other software for employers. And there really have been very few things that broke out of those categories. And uh, I always laugh when I talk to an industry analyst and they're like, so I'm hearing about you from all of your customers. They love working with you, but what are you? What box do I put you in? And uh, I think that you know, sometimes you have to be able to feel the box exist before you can really clearly draw the parameters and, uh, and give the exact measurements. Yeah, and sometimes when we get started, we know we're, we're designing a new kind of box. We directionally know where it is, but sometimes even we can't quite articulate it. Have you had that experience? Yes, I think that um, sometimes, especially if you see something very, very clearly, it can be hard to explain it or to get the exact right words for it uh, for other people. Kind of like you were talking before, you know, you see something in your head and how do you help other people see that vision? And there's this particularly fascinating thing that happens sometimes when you hear somebody else say a phrase and all of a sudden you realize, especially if maybe they're actually trying to describe your vision or your future strategy, what makes you different to someone else, you hear them say it and you realize yeah, that is true, but it's so fundamental that I hadn't even thought to pull it out of my brain and hold it up as um, one of the descriptors. And um, I think that can be, I mean, that's one of the reasons I love talking to other people, getting all of this feedback from users, from customers, from board members, from, you know, sometimes total strangers. It's not necessarily that they tell you what to do, although sometimes people give you fantastic ideas, but sometimes in their uh, questions or in their um, sort of echoing back to you elements of what you've said, you can either realize, no, that's not it. I have to change how I'm describing it or yes, yes, exactly that. Um, it helps you understand 
what are those words and concepts that allow you to bring someone else into the vision. And of course, it's also, I think one of the most exciting things about building a company is you go from in the early days when it's all vision and no execution to being, you know, six years in like we are, you can start to see the outlines of some of what we're building live on the muse.com. You know, parts of it work. Is it anything like it's going to be in another five years? Of course not. But for me, that is, um, that's one of the most exciting things about this whole process. Yeah, I love it. And I love that. It's very clear that's the kind of thing you're doing. The other thing I'd say, and I don't mean to throw McKinsey under the bus, I have tremendous respect for McKinsey. Uh, I have many friends who, who are partners there. Uh, Fred Gluck was on a board uh, of mine years and years ago. I think Marvin Bauer is one of the greatest entrepreneurs and category designers of all time. So I have a lot of respect for McKinsey. And if in the beginning you had paid McKinsey $5 million to do a study to say, should we or shouldn't we do the Muse? Um, I, I'm not sure the answer would have come back and said, yeah, go do this. This is a great idea. Is, is that fair? Um, I mean, I'm sure everybody that I knew thought that I was a little crazy. Um, there were not a lot of people in the early days saying like, yeah, definitely quit your job and go do this. <laughs> well, actually, you know what? It's funny. I don't know if that's 100% true. We got most of the people that were part of the establishment or people that were more successful, uh, a lot of people who are in the investor community, people looked at us and said, like, there's not a need for another career site. Or, you know, one guy was like, LinkedIn's already won. Why are you bothering? Somebody else pulled up monster.com and said, you know, this looks fine to me, uh, which is hilarious because it's so obviously not fine to anyone who's ever actually it, used it. It looks like a sack of shit to me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's pretty accurate. And so, you know, I think that the thing that helped me um, to keep going, uh, you know, separate from or in addition to just this sort of core gut instinct was that when I met sort of ordinary people, um, a lot of people in the early stages of their career or people who had been through a major career change, they were the ones who was like, yeah, this is incredibly needed. Please keep going. And I think that um, it also helped me realize that feedback from the outside you kind of have to categorize it or contextualize it based on who's giving the feedback. Are they an actual user of the product or service that you're building? Uh, what are their other possible interests? Um, because, you know, not all feedback is created equal. It doesn't mean they're not going to really attempt to gather and learn from it. But based on who's giving you advice or perspective, I find that it's varying levels of useful and, and also um, varying levels of accuracy in some cases. Yes. So how would you today, uh, Catherine, uh, describe what the muse is now? Yeah, um, I would describe us as a beloved and trusted career destination that helps individuals and companies connect on a more authentic level. So we want for individuals to be the best place for them to research companies and careers. We have uh, well upwards of 50 million people annually who come to themuse.com and probably another 25 million plus on all of our various uh, channels. We partner with our employers to power their candidate experience. We work with um, a lot of companies who want to share more information about their employer culture organically through social media. And then for those companies, we believe that finding the right employees starts with being more transparent, authentic about the company culture and the employee experience that you have to offer. So I don't believe it's about you know, ranking or labeling companies like good or bad. I think it's different, right? Are they more highly structured and, uh, you know, and, and things are very, very clear cut or is it very amorphous and ambiguous and freeform? Neither of those are necessarily better or worse. It depends on what an individual is looking for. And so we have a lot of um, backend tools that help employers source data and content from their employees to figure out what is it actually like to work here and then to spread that story organically on the news.com and through any of their other sort of owned channels. And I've heard you talk about this. You, it seems like you, you, your, your paying customers are the employers themselves, yes? Mm -hmm. And you're helping them sort of deal with the new reality that, uh, you know, sort of a, a, um, a job section of a website with some job descriptions and maybe a call out testimonial or two kind of isn't going to get it done anymore. That there's a whole new way there's a whole new level, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but transparency, uh, a whole new way to attract candidates. So, so maybe 
if you could unpack what this new way of being in, in the world of a potential candidate pool should be. Yeah, well, I think we helped create that reality because one of the reasons I started The Muse was that most of the companies I went to, um, I would click on their jobs page and it was like a robot threw up all over the page. Like there was nothing there except for just a list of jobs. And I remember thinking like, you're spending millions of dollars marketing and branding your products or your services because you have to convince people to buy from you. You should have to convince people to work for you. And you frankly do um, because the, you know, the errand which you could just like slap a help wanted sign on the window and thousands of great candidates would just line up at your door. Like that's, that's over. And so for us, it's about understanding what do candidates care about? What's going to help them make the decision to work for your company? And how, as an organization, can you share that information in the most authentic and transparent way? Um, and I, I use the words authentic because I think that, you know, as an industry, the first initial reaction to realizing that candidates wanted to learn more about your company before they apply was, great, we have to make our company seem like the most awesome place ever. And so this was the era of, you know, we're going to take a picture of some people in beanbag chairs. We'll have a stock photo of a bunch of people like standing around laughing. Um, Somebody that, with their dog at their desk. <laughs> yeah. I think first of all, like stock photos fall flat because people can see through that shit a mile away. And so, you know, the first thing they had to do was really convince employers, you need to have photos of your actual employees in your actual office building and they need to be real people and real photos. Now we're giving them tools to actually get data and insights from their employees at scale. So, you know, how can you understand at a larger company what's different about being in your Austin office versus being in your Boston office or working on your engineering team versus working on your sales team? And so we actually have a number of different tools that we've developed and actually one that we acquired. Uh, we did our first acquisition last summer, which was really exciting. Congratulations. And um, it's really, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, it's actually been a great experience and one of the founders of that company is still working at the Muse. Um, but it's really about, you know, both helping to get a more authentic picture of what it's like to work at a company and then helping to share that not just on the Muse.com, but also on that company's career page, on their social channels, um, on their LinkedIn, anywhere that they're talking to candidates. We want to help uh, make sure that it's much more um, authentic and also more human, I guess, for lack of a better word, because um, recruiting can really easily feel highly transactional. Like it's just a series of machines talking to each other. You know, people feel like they get reduced to a resume. But at the end of the day, the choice of what job to take, what organization to join is really personal. It's really meaningful. And I think the best companies are recognizing that. And they're thinking about how to treat their applicants and their prospective applicants with more respect, um, give them more information. And, and also, again, just um, start to build those human relationships which is also important because even if someone doesn't join your company this time around, they might be a great candidate for the next job, or they might have a friend or a family member who's an amazing candidate. If you don't treat them well, research shows that they're going to actively tell people not to apply to your job. Yeah. Yeah. This is interesting. I was just having a conversation uh, last weekend with a friend of mine. Uh, she's a nurse and she's, um, she's sort of looking for new employment. And she was sharing with me how uh, sort of, she, these are not her words, these are my words. So, but how candidate hostile t the typical hospital's website is and that like the form she needs to fill out could choke a horse and, it, it, and it's complicated and you got to go here and, and then if you don't get a thing right, then this red thing pops up. And, 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 you know, she just said like for some number of them, just fuck it. Like this form is too hard. Like go fuck yourself, right? Yeah. Why isn't there a button that says, hey, uh, here's the URL to my LinkedIn profile. Bob's your uncle and like we're done. Or you know, I, I look, I don't know what best practices are. So I'm just making that up. But the point being, she was sharing with me how hard it was to be a candidate. And I said to her, I would have thought, you know, it's 2018 that these and, and the job market being what it is and, and nurses being in such high demand and she's very experienced and, you know, got an incredible track record, et cetera that they would be falling all over themselves and she's explaining uh, what a pain in the ass and actually how hard it is. Uh, so I guess that leads me to a question, Catherine, which is how common do you think that is? Uh, it's very common and we see it in our data. Uh, the drop off rates for essentially when someone starts applying to your company and when they complete, um, I don't have a, I mean, averages are all across the board based on size of the company, et cetera. But uh, on the worst end, it's not uncommon to see applications where 92 to 94 percent of people literally stop applying, throw up their hands and leave because it's such a terrible experience. 
And, you know, I, I partially think that this is related to the way historically uh, that HR has been treated by a lot of organizations, right? I mean, literally just think of your instinctive reaction to the word HR, right? Um, you know, it, it could be this sort of incredible strategic function that's responsible for all of the human capital and potential in your organization, but often historically, HR was treated like a back office, a cost center. And um, I think that because of that, it often didn't get the investment, the resources, um, or sometimes the talent to, you know, to, to build systems that would treat people better, to create processes that would be more streamlined. And also for a while, companies got lazy because they were used to feeling like their job was just to post the job. And then great candidates were just going to, you know, line up begging to work there. Yeah. And I think we've seen that that's no longer the case. And so it is really encouraging to me that a lot of companies are starting to think about the candidate experience both the application process as well as what happens afterwards. You know, we did this fascinating partnership with uh, Johnson & Johnson, and um, they built out this incredible candidate experience platform called Shine, and they worked with us and a couple of other partners. And you know, one of the things that uh, George, who's their global head of uh, recruiting and talent acquisition, he's like, look, you can track a pizza on your iPhone. Why shouldn't you be able to know where your application is? Um, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it, it seems tell you when the basic. Guy FedEx can tell you when the guy stopped to take a poop on the way over, right? I mean, come on. Well, here's the thing, though, right? Imagine you're the talent acquisition leader in one of these companies, and you believe that this is the way things should be done. So you go to your CFO, and you say, hey, we need to invest in this. And he says, all right, first of all, um, I can't pull the engineers off of the things that they're doing. They're working on our product roadmap, and a lot of people still prioritize that above your talent roadmap. You can argue the merits of that. He's like, what's it going to cost me? You come up with a figure, you know, depending on the size of the company, maybe if I want to spend $10,000, maybe if I want to spend half a million dollars. And in many cases, um, the leadership says, okay, what's the ROI? What's the ROI on treating candidates better? What's the ROI on not scaring away 92% of our applicants before they apply? Um, what's fascinating is until a couple of years ago, there wasn't a massive amount of industry data that would support those conversations. And so you had people either trying to build a case from scratch themselves, or in some cases, losing out on the battle to improve these systems, because, you know, I believe that you should treat candidates with respect. And now there's fantastic research about what happens when you don't. But again, a lot of it is from the last sort of one to two years. Before that, I think that um, unless you sort of emotionally bought in to this idea of humanizing your candidate experience, being more authentic in how you recruit, it's really hard to see that in the data. And a lot of people, you know, they're very, um, and business is hard, right? And, and things kind of often get stack ranked according to prioritization. And in many cases, if you couldn't prove the value of that, it, it fell off the bottom. Now what I think is so interesting is that chief executives are starting to really wake up to the reality that if you don't have the right talent, your business goes nowhere. And so what does it mean to get the right talent? Well, you have to treat them better. You have to build better systems. I mean, all of the things we're talking about. So yeah. for me, it's a really exciting time to be part of the industry because I think there's an opportunity for HR to stop being HR and start being a highly strategic talent and people function. But it's going to take a lot of work to get there. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Catherine, you say that. I grew up in part in the um, CRM world, right? And um, as we've gone into the state that we are today, which is at least in the United States, you tell me, almost virtually zero unemployment, um, that somewhere along the line, I figured this discussion would stop because as you look at the environment we're in, if you, particularly for high quality, high caliber people at whatever kind of function, whether they're you know, plumbers or coders or whatever they are, um, we have choices today. We have options today we never had. And so my point is, I would have, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have guessed that by this time, uh, CEOs in particular would look at um, talent acquisition, if I can call it that, call it that, as if it, or as strategically as they do customer acquisition. And that just like I would never do business without a CRM function, and I think about the customer experience. I think about today we talk about omni-channel and all the good stuff on the on the marketing and sales side, and on the customer experience side, and all that. That by now it would be a no shit Sherlock that you have to have that same level of technology, that same level of thinking, that same level of experience. You tell me, I'm, I'm you know, you're the expert. 
but that it would be a, it would be an, it would be a, of course that you'd have to have that in the talent domain. Yeah. You know, it's, it's coming, it's changing, but slowly. And I think, um, you know, the, I think it was the conference board did a survey in 2016 of all of their global CEOs, asked them to rank a wide variety of issues and the failure to attract and retain top talent came out number one ahead of acquiring customers, growing revenue, the overall economy, the competitive landscape. I mean, this is something that leaders are realizing they have to take really, really seriously. The challenge is um, it takes a while for that to cascade through an entire organization. Um, what this means is, you know, when uh, when I look at a lot of our, our HR partners, and we work with, you know, many of the Fortune 1000, as well as a lot of fast-growing smaller companies, um, some of the people that are leading up talent functions are new to talent, but they were great people leaders, very data-driven in other functions. Many of them um, have been in talent for a while, but they're learning new skills and really leveling up. And I think it comes down to um, how fast can you change expectations within an industry. In some ways, you know, people are arguing that talent is an NHR sort of going through what marketing went through, but five to 10 years later. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's exciting to be part of that, but it can be frustrating as well because, you know, you're talking with people that some people really see clearly the future where we're going, why it matters. And then you also deal with a lot of people who are still trying to do things the way they did them 10 years ago. And, um, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of like creating a new category, that's really hard. A lot of people told us we shouldn't bother, but when the only existing categories are job boards or applicant tracking systems, like I don't want to be part of either one of those categories and I don't think that's the best way to do things. So anyway, I'm off on my, <laughs> off on my channel. No, no, but th th that's why I love your passion. I also, I, I have to compliment you. Um, I like to say the E in CEO stands for evangelist. And, and like the evangelism for the mission that you're on just comes oozing out of your pores. And I think that's what great founders, great CEOs, great leaders are. So I know I, I love your tangent. Now I, I, I do want to ask you, um, there's a couple of specifics I have, but I'll, I'll start with a broad one. Whenever one embarks on a journey like this, and uh, I was just trying to do the back of the envelope math. Am I getting this right? Were you 26 when you started the Muse with your co-founders? Yeah. Yep. So there's always unexpected failures, disappointments. We invented a word around here to try to make it sound better than it is, but to try to make losing fun. We call it losery, that there's going to be losery along the way. Some of it's self-inflicted. Some of it just happens. So with all that said, tell me a little bit about some of the professional and, and, and the personal over the last, uh, you know, since you were 26, uh, six, over the last six years, the losery along the way so far. Yeah. Um there's been a lot. I mean, I'm sure anyone that tells you otherwise is, is probably BSing. So three big uh, points of losery um, that, that come to mind. Um, the first is, I don't know how many will know this, but, um, you know, before I started the news, I actually started another company that was kind of in the same vein or sort of direction. And it was a horrific failure. So we can talk more about that. Um, losery point two was the first three and a half years of the muse. Um, it basically took us three and a half years to raise like serious venture capital. And that and I, is a I, long I hate, time. I hate to interrupt so. you, Catherine, but I, I heard you say somewhere, maybe I read it somewhere. You'll excuse me. I've been, as I said, I've been consuming a lot of you over the last little week or so, <laughs> but there was a giant number. How, how many venture capitalists said no to you over that three year period? Uh, 148. And it was angel investors too. Uh, wait, wait, wait. I, I just have to stop. You. Uh, yeah, 148. So, yeah. look, some of us have thick skins. It sounds like you, you're a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but how, how does one withstand 138 or 48? 48. How does one withstand 148 no's? Uh, lots of crying. <laughs> No, it, it sucks, right? It, it's horrible. Um, I didn't count them until after it was done, so that helped. Um, I I was getting feedback from users that they loved what we were doing at the same time as I was getting all these no's, so that made me feel like I wasn't completely insane. And the way that some people said no, 
only made me want to work harder to show them that they were wrong, right? Like the people that were no thoughtfully or respectfully or just like couldn't get over the hump, in some ways those were the hardest because I still respected them and they were saying no. Um, and a lot of people were, were nice about it, but I also encountered a ton of honestly, like truly horrible people where, um, you know, they would say no and then add something like asinine, like monster.com looks great to me. It just made me feel like you're a complete idiot and you don't know anything about the market or, um, and thankfully this seems to be changing a bit, but I also got a lot of like very overt sexism. Um, our first, uh, user community at the news was predominantly female. And I cannot tell you how many investors said things to me like, aren't you going to lose all your users once they, you know, turn 30 and have babies with all this like weird hand gesturing as if they kind of knew it was really inappropriate. Or um, a number of people said, well, you know, your users right now are in New York and San Francisco and LA. You won't be able to grow out of that because people outside of the coast don't care about their careers. Sorry, women outside of the coast don't care about their careers. Um, or I asked my wife who quit her job 22 years ago to take care of our kids because I'm a super rich guy. And, you know, she thought this sounded nice, but I didn't really feel like she'd use it. So I don't think other women will use your product. And I just remember thinking, like, do you know any women, like, other than the one or two that you're clearly basing this misguided worldview on? And that, those comments just made me want to work five times as hard because I couldn't believe that they were so blind to the new reality of the world. And I thought, you know, if I don't show them, like, who will? So I do think it can help to have a little bit of that, uh, that kind of fuck you gene. Yeah, I have a lot of that fuck you gene. Because <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I got said 100, no to 148 times, but I got said no to a lot. And I was written off before I even started. And uh, nobody saw or nobody, not nobody, that's not fair. But most people didn't see any potential in me. I got thrown out of school at 18 for being stupid, blah, blah, blah. And, and so I, I relate to that. So I, lo I love how much the nose uh, fueled your fire because I, I really do relate to that. I think that's very cool. Um, now, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. In the beginning, if I remember this right, the Muse was primarily targeted at uh, millennial job seekers. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And today it sounds like it's more broad than that. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I... I like to talk about the next gen mindset. So it's not about age, but it is very much about people that are uh, looking forward to the future and committed to new ways of doing things. So about two thirds of our audience is under 35 um, and one third is older than that. And again, what we see when we kind of cut the data by age is that the biggest differences are actually around mindset, not about you know, the year that you were born. But it is interesting that if I'm getting the number right, so you over 50 million people to the site, never mind the other various executions that you have. So I'm guessing, you know, a very big number. But what, what percentage of them are under 35? Uh, it's about two thirds. Two thirds. That's fascinating. So um, if, I'm a, if I'm a CEO, if I'm a hiring manager, if I'm a CHRO, if I'm a recruiter, what would you tell me? And I was, let's say I'm older than 35. Uh, so I'm not in that demographic. What would you tell me that I need to know about that demographic that maybe would be surprising to me? You know, I'm not a huge fan of uh, blanket generalizations. So maybe actually I'll, I'll push back and say a lot a of... stupid question. That's okay. You can kick no. me under the table. It's all right. <laughs> No, you know what's interesting, right, is um, I do talk to a lot of, of CHROs or CEOs, and interestingly, a lot of them come to the table with these preconceptions about millennials, like they all want ping pong tables in the office, or everybody wants to work for Facebook. And what I find, uh, you know, when you, when you really look at user behavior on the Muse and, and all of these people, firstly, is that there's, again, far more diversity within the generation than, um, than most people would expect. And secondly, that there are some sort of lump categories of motivations, but you can't paint millennials with the same brush. So for example, there's a large group of our users who deeply care about pathways to growth, learning, development. Uh, it's not totally surprising, particularly for people in the early stages of their career. We have another large bucket of users who care about the people they're going to be working with. So, you know, office social events, the colleagues they'll learn from, mentorship, 
Um, and then we also have a lot of people who are very motivated by purpose. So what's the overall meaning? Am I making the world better in some way or at least having some sort of impact? And what's interesting is some people fall in all three of those buckets. Some people spike very deeply on one. We sort of call them people, purpose, and path uh, for shorthand. But, um, you know, I, I still think that for companies, rather than trying to sort of generically appeal to some sense of like millennials want X, Y, Z, for us, it's very much about helping companies understand what they have to offer. It may not be all three of those things all the time. What are the things that are strongest for you as an employer? What are the things that your current employees really love? Um, how can you share more about those and figure out what your current employees don't like and maybe try and make it better if you'd like to keep them. And I heard you say somewhere, and you correct me if I'm misconstruing it, uh, that um, if you take a generic sort of recruiting page of a company and change the logo, it's almost impossible to tell who's who. Did I hear you say that? Yes, that's becoming less true, which is a really good thing. But it used to be, I mean, they were identical almost. It was like teamwork, innovation, committed to excellence, blah, 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 the same stuff. Yeah, it, it, sooner or later, it starts to sound like the parents in the peanut cartoons, the wah, 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 wah. And then the other thing I heard you say that I thought sounded like at least maybe part of the corollary to this was um, that when you allowed your employees themselves to actually share what it was like to be you know, a customer service person or a salesperson or work in finance or work in the warehouse, whatever it is, that what comes out of the employee's mouth a, is much more accurate and, of course, by definition, authentic, and B, resonates much more powerfully with a potential candidate to go work in customer service or sales or whatever. So could you expand upon that maybe a little bit for me, Catherine? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start by saying that um, Edelman, the firm, did this great research called their Trust Barometer, where they figured out, um, or at least they did some research to sort of high-level look at uh, what do people trust? And the answer is it's not necessarily the CEO. Uh, it's definitely not the company's corporate website, but it is their employees, the other humans. It's this very kind of, you know, humans trust humans, not necessarily brands. And I think we're seeing that a lot today across a lot of channels, you know, whether it's um, getting reviews through social media of a product before you buy it or um, expecting brands on Twitter to talk like actual humans, not like, you know, corporate jargon. And so we kind of took this one step further and said, if you're trying to recruit, I mean, I'll take a really easy example. Engineering is one of the hardest roles to recruit for right now. There are, I believe, five open engineering jobs for every developer looking for work. So good luck, first of all. But, I hate to interrupt you. I just want to underscore that. Say that again. There are five open engineering roles for every developer that's actively looking for work. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's really hard to higher engineers. And a lot of companies, you know, their only choice historically has been to hire a recruiter or have someone in-house reach out to engineers. But, you know, if you're a great engineer, you want to talk to another engineer. You want to understand, like, what's the project you're working on? What's your stack? Like, there's a lot of this detail when you really get into what does it mean to do a role and how is that role performed here differently than perhaps at other companies that is much more both accurate and trusted if you get it from other employees. So I mentioned earlier that we did our first acquisition last year and that's basically what it was. It's a, it's a tool. Um, the company was called Brand Amber, but we call it Brand Builder now when we um, have incorporated it into the Muse. And I, I love it. I'm like a total geek about this, but it basically lets us go into a company's employee base with that company's permission and get a lot of insights from people in all different roles, different locations, different backgrounds, you know, seniority, et cetera, about like, what does it actually mean to do their jobs? And again, it's fascinating because the way that an engineer might like totally geek out about what they're doing to another engineer is going to be so much more useful and probably fun than you know, corporate jargons. Um, so I think that for, for me, um, we're only scratching the surface of this. There's so much more that's possible, but I feel like the, the really big opportunity going forward is to think about how do you source uh, content and insights from the current employees of a company to give prospective employees or people outside the org a better sense of the role. And I think it's, it's, useful both in what are you actually doing in that job it's useful in the sense of what does it feel like to be at the company what's the the vibe the culture you can use your own kind of language for it um and you know that i think can be can be really powerful so 
again, we're just sort of getting started there. Um, yeah. But um, I think that it's, it also has the potential to bring back a little bit of the, the fun of exploring different companies and careers. You know, when we're kids, all of us were like, ooh, what do I want to be when I grow up? And there was this like, I want to be Batman. I, do, I wanted to be Batman. Did you? I really want it. Yes, I, I really want to be I Batman. I think you might be turning into Batman, though. You're <laughs> off to a hell of a start. I have, um, I have to sign up here. I, you probably can't see it because it might be off camera, no. but m my wife, Carrie, got it for me. It says, I'm not saying I'm Batman. I'm just saying no one's ever seen me and Batman in the same room together. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It's funny. I was actually just telling, um, so we do a new hire breakfast every, uh, roughly every month or so for everyone who's joined the Muse. My co-founder and I take everybody out to breakfast. And I don't know why it came up, but I was just telling people yesterday morning this story about I used to actually tell my parents that I was going to go into my room and like they were not to bother me for any reason. And then I'd get dressed up in my Batman costume, which was like a towel, like nothing actually merchandised from Batman. And I'd come out and be like, it's Batman. Where's Catherine? And I'd literally like go around the neighborhood to the neighbors and like make everyone be like, oh, we haven't seen Catherine. But like, we'll tell her that Batman was here looking for her. And uh, I look back and I'm just like, geez, like everyone was so nice to me. But anyway, I really, really wanted to be Batman. And I thought I had all the neighbors fooled, but probably they figured it out. Well, I, I'd be willing to bet you're Batman in your spare time. <laughs> no, actually, maybe that's a, a nice way to transition a little bit. So uh, on the personal side, Catherine, you may know um, in 2016, the Wall Street Journal declared, quote, a crisis in American entrepreneurship. We are now at a point in uh, American history where we're at the lowest level of recorded entrepreneurship ever. And the millennials are on track to be the first American generation to, that's going to be a less entrepreneurial and also less well off than their parents. And so um, your generation is, n you, you stand out in your generation in a pretty remarkable kind of way. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are in general about sort of entrepreneurship and what it's been like for you personally, starting particularly at such a young age, over the last six years in your, in your life outside the office, um, mm -hmm. at this stage of your life doing what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, firstly, I, um, I always try and, and encourage and support other people uh, to think about starting companies because honestly, it had never crossed my, my mind or my radar as something I could do until I, um, I had a friend who ended up working at a startup. And uh, I went into the office. It was tiny and shitty office and you know, really early stage. And I also thought the idea was not that great. But I remember going into the office and feeling the energy and realizing like, these people think they can create a company. And that's cool. And also, what if I could do that? And then when I worked at McKinsey, I had a good friend who started um, Sir Kensington's, the uh, organic condiment or the condiment brand. And it was amazing. And I just, I loved, um, I loved the experience. I actually helped him like go into uh, uh, restaurants in New York City that were serving Heinz, drop off a little bag with like the Sir Kensington's card and, you know, like apple cider vinegar instead of, uh, you know, I don't know, instead of whatever. It was like all the good ingredients. I could rattle off the whole pitch. And um for certain people, I think there's something that feels like coming home when you discover the entrepreneurial tribe because it's, it's an activity that, I don't know, that, that I found fulfilling in a way that um, nothing else had really scratched that itch. And so I love encouraging other people to think about starting businesses. I don't think everyone needs to start one, but at least to recognize that it, it's something to think about and it could be um, an option, especially for people who are from groups that, you know, that aren't traditionally told that they could start businesses, right? If you're like a Stanford or Harvard dropout, like especially if you're like a young white guy, you probably get a lot of that positive reinforcement. But I don't think necessarily that for a lot of people who come from different backgrounds, different genders, races, like they don't necessarily see themselves in what's held up as the perfect entrepreneur. Um, that said, I do think there are a lot of really structural reasons that being an entrepreneur is harder than ever before. Um, I had a really close friend who had a company that I thought was um, I thought it was a great concept. She started it around the same time that I started the Muse and she ended up having to shut it down during a tough time because she couldn't make her student loan payments. Um, I was really lucky. I didn't grow up with a lot of money, but I ended up getting a merit-based scholarship to college 
and I didn't have student loans. And, you know, I worked for three and a half years at no salary to like 42K. I think at the very end, we were up at like 48 or 50K um, living in Manhattan and New York City or in Brooklyn for part of it. Um, but that is not easy. And if I'd had to support anyone else in my family, I don't know if I could have made it. If I'd had to pay student loans or other ma major expenses, it's um, interesting healthcare, you, obviously. Like, it's interesting you bring that up, Catherine, because the Wall Street Journal story I mentioned referenced some research from MIT and Brookings, and they looked at a number of factors for why this was a case. And the one you're on was a very big one, because if you're somebody who's in their early to mid-20s, you're graduating, and you have, whether it's 30000 or in some cases, $300,000 worth of debt, you're like, holy fuck, I better go work at Microsoft here because it's going to take me till I'm 45 to pay this shit off, right? It doesn't make you want yeah. to take a lot of entrepreneurial risk. And so that was yeah. a advantage for you. Yeah, it really was. And I think that, you know, we don't sometimes talk about privilege in entrepreneurship because starting a business, no matter where you come from, is so hard that I think, you know, the media loves to lionize like the self-made entrepreneur, but, um, you know, but the fact is, like, there are so many different factors that affect whether it's even harder or easier for you. Um, you know, do you have a safety net to fall back on? Even if you deplete all of your savings, you know, could you move in with family or friends? Um, or are you supporting family or friends and, and they need you to keep working and keep drawing a paycheck in order for them to be able to have housing? You know, there's, it's just, it's very complicated. And so I'm a, a, obviously a big proponent of thinking through how do we support more entrepreneurship um, and creativity because, uh, you know, you just look at the sort of impacts to, sure, the economy, but also our day-to-day -day lives from these services like, uh, you know, Airbnb, Uber, like all of these things, Rent the Runway, I'm, I'm a huge fan of right now. And um, it makes me... Such a you simple know, but legendary idea, is it not? Absolutely. That's and one actually, of those, when it comes out, you're like, ah. Oh, Ugh, I wish I thought that one. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I, I think about what are all of the brilliant companies that weren't built because the founders that had the idea either couldn't get funded because of how they looked or where they came from, or they weren't able to get through the early crunch period that almost every company inevitably has at some point because they, you know, they had other obligations, they had debt, they had this or that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, again, it's not a problem with an easy solution, but I don't think that means it's, um, you know, it's not a problem that, that's really worth solving. And, and, you know, you kick me when I get too personal, but sort of how do you also think about your, your life? I, I don't know whether you're married or not or whether you have children or not. or you know, How do you think about those components outside of your, your working day in and day out at the Muse and, and, and making your, if, if you will, your whole life work in the context of, um, this amazing company you're trying to create? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, so I am married and uh, I met my husband while I was, you know, in the early days of building my business. It was probably two years in to building the Muse or so. And um, I think that, you know, it, it's hard as an entrepreneur sometimes to remember to carve out time for anything else. Um, and I haven't always been good at it. I think there's times when my relationship has suffered because I'm just too deep in work. Um, there was definitely a period of time where I realized I had not spent as much time with friends or hobbies or other things because work was taking up most of my time. And then my relationship got like a little bit, but, but strong quality protected time. And then all of a sudden there was nothing else left and I had no hobbies and, and hadn't seen some of my closest friends in three months. And I realized like, this is not how I want to live. Um, so I don't know and that I, I have I don't know about answer. your husband, but I'm a very needy husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very lucky. Um, my husband is also an entrepreneur. And so we, we have somewhat similar sort of schedules and intensity. The hard thing is, um, you know, we do eventually want to have kids and, and who knows how we're going to make that work. But I, I, have, I basically have faith that like we'll deal with it when we get, you know, when we get there. Um, but it's tough. And I think part of it for me is just being intentional. Um, cause it can be really easy to just decide, you know, every single day as sort of like a local maximum, like optimizing that day and then end up with a month or a quarter that you actually don't feel good about how you spent your time. So I try periodically to write out, how do I want to be spending my time? Which friends do I want to make sure to see? And how often do I want to invest in those relationships? What's important to me with my husband and how do I really give us sort of unprotected or kind of 
protected time, uninterrupted time. And then I think it's really important to be present when you're there. Because, you know, if you spend a little less time than people, then maybe it's perfectly ideal. But when you're with them, you are there and you are in and you are present and committed. To me, that, that works. It's not ideal, but it works versus being with someone but having half your mind at work or thinking about other things. Um, I find that really frustrating when other people do it to me and I work really, really hard not to do it to other people. Do you, do you find, Catherine, what I find, which is part of it's technology, part of it's just a lifestyle we've you know, grown into, but we're all so permanently distracted that what you and I are doing right now seems like it's rarer and rarer where two people put their freaking phones down They look each other in the eye and they sit down and they try to have a a substantive conversation and hopefully have some fun along the way, but really get into some, you know, get into some topics with each other in a, in a uh, undistracted real way. Like people used to look each other in the eye and just get into it. You know, maybe it's just because I, I prioritize people that also find that important, but, um, I feel like I've forced that into my life. Like I just have very little patience for the sort of half on the phones, half out. It's one thing if you both agree, like I've definitely, I have a lot of friends where we'll say, oh, hey, do you mind if we just both check our phones for two minutes? Like I have to do X, Y, Z, or I need to coordinate with the nanny or whatever it is. Like, let me call my husband or my wife. That's totally fine because it's intentional. But then both people finish, they put their phones away and they plug back in. And uh, for me, I just don't know that I have a lot of tolerance for too many relationships that aren't willing to do that because again we don't you know most of us are really busy don't have a ton of time to spend with each other and so let's um you know when we're at work let's freaking be at work and, and do that and crush it and when we're with each other uh let's try and do that and i apologize i'm gonna have to go in just a minute or two because i'm actually supposed to uh hop into something a little after 4 30. well no problem is there anything else before we kick out of this one Catherine? <laughs> um no i this has been i mean i Happy to have you uh, <laughs> wrap however you want, but I feel like we've covered all the stuff that was on, on my radar in a super interesting conversation. Well, I want to thank you. you. What you're doing is incredibly inspiring. I wish you a ton of success. Obviously, we have some friends in common, and, um, uh, you know, I just I love what you're doing. And um, uh, félicitations, as we say en français. And, um, Merci beaucoup, monsieur. <laughs> and I hope you build a giant, incredibly valuable category queen business. Thank you so much. Working on it. Thanks, Catherine. Be legendary, my friend. Great to talk to you. Great to Take talk care. To you. Wowie, wee wow. Um, you know, I know I say it a lot. I can't, I just, I'm so stoked that I get to have these conversations and that we get to share them with you. Um, if you know somebody in your life who would benefit, who would be inspired, who would be excited, uh, who would learn something from Catherine, why not email them this episode right now from your smartphone or whatever you're experiencing Legends and Losers on. And we would love it if you helped us share Catherine with the world by sharing this episode on social media. Um, all right. We would like to thank <laughs> themuse.com. Find everything you need to succeed from dream jobs to career advice at themuse.com. The amazing people at Verve Coffee, the leader in West Coast craft coffee. Um, Verve is the official coffee of Legends and Losers. I love these guys. I've been working with these guys for uh, quite a while. I love the coffee. I love the guys. I love the mission. You can check out Verve at, in beautiful Santa Cruz, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Tokyo, and always at vervecoffee.com. Harper Collins Instant Classic Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Equity Directory. This is the place for people who work in the startup ecosystem. If you're a startup and you're looking for talent, check out equitydirectory.com. If you are a consultant, an advisor, a designer, a developer, or somebody else who wants to work with startups and you want to exchange at least part of your work for equity, you need to get set up at equitydirectory.com. Our good friends at OneLifeFullyLive.org. This is the nonprofit that wants you to dream, plan, and live your best life. We try to deliver as much amazing content around how to do that for as close to free as possible. We have some incredible conferences in the United States. Check out OneLifeFullyLive.org. The good people at Second Flight Consultancy. Uh, This is Nick Cullen's business. He's a good buddy of mine. Um, They will help you growth hack your way to new heights. 
and they are the official growth hackers of Legends and Losers. Secondflightconsultancy.com. TerraCycle, um, the amazing business uh, from our friend Tom Zazaki. Check out TerraCycle.com. Recycle everything. And one of my favorite podcasts from the nicest man in podcasting, Stop Riding the Pine with Jamie J. And if you want to make a difference in the world, check out Kiva, K-I-V-A dot org. They're set up to allow you to uh, provide micro loans to developing entrepreneurs in the developing world, and these loans make a gigantic difference. All right. We would like to remind you that this podcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love it if you shared the shit out of it. Now, all rights do remain disturbed. We must warn you that this oddcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Teach girls entrepreneurship. Remember that objects and mirrors are probably behind you. Do not pour hot coffee on your crotch. Listening to Legends and Losers makes you more sexy. Only buy pasture-raised, free-range eggs. Practice diversity. Hey, man, careful. There's a beverage here. I don't feel tardy. Remember to enjoy Mother Nature. Thank you so much, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Marcus Rust, chief executive and owner of Rose Acre Farms. Sorry, Marcus, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with us. And we look forward to seeing you again soon on Legends and Losers. <laughs>